Hey, what's up to it, kids? Shabbat Shalom. Long time no see. It's been a little while since we've seen each other, hasn't it? I'd say it's been a few weeks. We've missed you, so we're glad you're back. Just in case you forgot, my name's Joey. I'm going to be your host this week. So, um, me and my family are doing something interesting today. Well, I just need to say this. Where I'm at right now, it's not Sabbath yet. So, you need to know that because later on today, that's going to be important. But, uh, me and my family are getting ready to go on a camping trip. So, we're going to go load up our camper. We're going to go to West Point Lake, and we're going to have a real good time. We're going to do a triathlon while in there, too. Kind of excited about that. But, anyway, whenever I get to thinking about camping, I think about tents. You like sleeping in tents? Yeah, it's fun, isn't it? I always think about Sukkot, but just, it, it's springtime, it's getting close to summer, it's the perfect time to go camping and just enjoy the great outdoors. But, oh, the reason why it's important is because today our lesson just happens to be about tents. Believe it or not, we're going to learn how Yahweh told the children of Israel to make a tent for him. Is that cool? <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, hey, I got a cool idea. What if we learn about how Yahweh told us to make a tent, and then I show you how to make a tent with stuff in your backyard? Would that be awesome? <laughs> okay, let's do it. All right, let's get started with this week's Sabbath school. We're going to have prayer. We're going to have song. Then we're going to hear the story about how Yahweh told the children of Israel to make him a tent. And when you get back, I'll show you how to make one too. Sound good? All right, let's get started. Shema Israel. Yahweh Eloheinu, Yahweh Echad, Baruch Shem Kevod, Malhuto Leolam Vayed. Amen, Amen. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. We're getting ready to get into this week's Sabbath school. But before we do that, we want to say a prayer. Yahweh, as we look at building your tabernacle and how you have instructed us to do that, let us also focus on our tabernacle as in ourselves and building ourselves and the body as a better place for, for you to dwell with us. We thank you for everyone who's joining us, and we pray that as we read through your word, that we all gain understanding and wisdom. Hallelujah. Five, four, three, two, we need to build a dwelling place, hurrah, hurrah. We need to build a dwelling place, hurrah, hurrah. Blue, purple, scarlet are the curtains for the dwelling place. Shemoth, or Exodus 26. 
and make the dwelling place with ten curtains of fine woven linen and blue and purple and scarlet material. Make them with carabim, the work of a skilled workman. The length of each curtain is 28 cubits, and the width of each curtain, 4 cubits, all the curtains having one measure. Five curtains are joined to each other, and five curtains are joined to each other. And you shall make loops of blue on the edge of the end curtain on one set, and do the same on the edge of the end curtain of the second set. Make 50 loops in the one curtain and make 50 loops on the edge of the end curtain of the second set, the loops being opposite to each other. And you shall make 50 hooks of gold and shall join the curtains together with the hooks and the dwelling place shall be one. And you shall make curtains of goat's hair for a tent over the dwelling place. Make 11 curtains. The length of each curtain is 30 cubits, and the width of each curtain, 4 cubits, one measure to the 11 curtains. And you shall join the 5 curtains by themselves and the 6 curtains by themselves. And you shall double over the 6 curtains at the front of the tent. And you shall make 50 loops on the edge of the curtain that is the outermost in one set and 50 loops on the edge of the curtain of the second set. And you shall make 50 bronze hooks and put the hooks into the loops and join the tent together and it shall be one. And the overlapping part of the rest of the curtains of the tent the half curtain that remains hang over the back of the dwelling place. And a cubit on one side and a cubit on the other side of what remains of the length of the curtains of the tent is to hang over the sides of the dwelling place on this side and on that side to cover it. And you shall make a covering of ram skins dyed red for the tent and a covering of fine leather above that and for the dwelling place, you shall make the boards of acacia wood standing up. Ten cubits is the length of a board, and a cubit and a half the width of each board. Two tenons in each board for binding one to another. Do the same for all the boards of the dwelling place, and you shall make the boards for the dwelling place twenty boards for the south side and make 40 sockets of silver under the 20 boards, two sockets under each of the boards for its two tenons, and for the second side of the dwelling place on the north side, 20 boards. And there are 40 sockets of silver, two sockets under each of the boards. And for the extreme parts of the dwelling place, westward make six boards, and make two boards for the two back corners of the dwelling place. And they are double beneath, and similarly, they are complete to the top, to the one ring. So it is for both of them. They are for the two corners. And they shall be eight boards, and their sockets of silver, 16 sockets, two sockets under the one board, and two sockets under the other board. And you shall make bars of acacia wood, five for the boards on one side of the dwelling place, and five bars for the boards on the other side of the dwelling place, and five bars for the boards of the side of the dwelling place for the extreme parts westward. With the middle of the bar in the midst of the boards going through from end to end. And overlay the boards with gold and make their rings of gold as holders for the bars and overlay the bars with gold. And you shall raise up the dwelling place according to its pattern which you were shown on the mountain. And you shall make a veil of blue and purple and scarlet material and fine woven linen, the work of a skilled workman made with carabine. 
and you shall put it on the four columns of acacia wood overlaid with gold, their hooks of gold upon four sockets of silver. And you shall hang the veil from the hooks and shall bring the ark of the witness there behind the veil. And the veil shall make a separation for you between the set apart and the most set apart place. And you shall put the lid of atonement upon the ark of the witness in the most set apart place. And you shall set the table outside the veil and the lampstand opposite the table on the side of the dwelling place toward the south. And put the table on the north side. And you shall make a covering for the door of the tent of blue and purple and scarlet material and fine woven linen made by a weaver. And you shall make for the covering five columns of acacia wood and overlay them with gold, their hooks of gold, and you shall cast five sockets of bronze for them. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. For today's nature lesson, we're going to learn about linen. When Yahweh gives the instructions on how to build his tabernacle, he says to make the curtains of fine twined linen. Well, what exactly is linen? Linen is a fabric produced from the flax plant. It's very strong, absorbent, and dries faster than cotton, making it excellent for clothing. Before we can make the fabric, the flax must be grown from seed. Once it reaches maturity, the plant must be harvested. But to harvest it, the flax must be pulled and not cut, roots and all. It's then set out to dry. After the flax has dried, the seeds must be removed. They are then processed so that they can be used for the following crop. The dry flax straw then goes through a process called redding. Redding releases the flax fibers from between the inner core and outer layers of the flax. So pretty much it separates the pieces so we can get the parts we need to use. After the flax is redded, it is ready to be processed. It has to go through three different processes. First, it's broken, where the woody material is broken up. Then, swingling. This removes the broken up woody material and separates it from the good stuff. And the last process is hackled, where short fibers are removed and the long fibers are aligned. This happens as it's smacked through tines. Now it's finally ready to be spun into thread. Yahweh gives instructions that the linen should be of blue, purple, and scarlet material. So it was probably dyed separately into those different colors and then woven into cloth. After all that hard work, the curtains are finally ready for the tabernacle. A huge thanks to Mia Wielander for the use of her amazing videos. I hope you enjoyed learning about linen, and I pray you have a blessed Shabbat. All right, we're back. What'd you think about that? I don't know about you, but when I read this section, it's kind of hard for me to visualize. You know, I went, whenever I look at directions, because really and truly, that's what that was. There was a whole bunch of directions about how to make the, the tent of meeting. But whenever I'm looking at directions, whenever I've got to build something, it's really helpful for me if I've got a picture where I can see it versus just reading the direction. So I always thought, man, it'd be cool if Moshe would have just like made a little diagram on the side for us to be able to look at, but it is what it is. So anyway, we learned about Yahweh's tent. Now let's learn about making one in our backyard. So what we're going to do today is we're going to make a structure called a tripod. And so when you think of a tripod, you may think about like a teepee type tent 
But the cool thing about a tripod is, is that you can use it to make all kinds of different tents. So we're going to learn how to make the, the tripod, and then I'll show you how it can be two, even possibly three tents with the same type materials, okay? So let's get started on that. In order to do it, you're going to need three sticks. So I want you to go outside, not on Sabbath. Once again, as I'm doing this, this is not Sabbath. So you're not supposed to be gathering sticks on Sabbath. But I want you to go out and find some sticks that are taller than you are. This is important because you need to be able to get into the teepee. And if you can't, if it's as tall, if it's shorter than you are, it's going to make it really hard to get down in there. Okay. So you want to be taller than you, a couple feet taller than you is probably good. And something about that big around, it's probably a good idea. Um, it can be a tree limb. If you've got bamboo in your yard, bamboo works great for this. But uh, anything like that, try to get it as straight as you can. It doesn't have to be perfectly straight. I'll show you the ones that I'm going to use. They're not straight super straight but they still work but either way you're gonna need three sticks and you're gonna need some kind of string you can use paracord you can use nylon cord um, I've seen in survival situations where people use fishing line to be able to do this so those are the materials you're gonna need for this and then I'm gonna show you how I'm gonna do it but we're gonna have to change the camera just a little bit so you can see over top so bear with me just a second all right kiddos we got Ashley on the camera which was important because I had no idea how we were gonna do this without it so First thing I want you to see is I've got three sticks laid out here. I've got two going this way, and then I've got a third one going that way. And the first thing that you're gonna notice is, is that they're different sizes. A little while ago, I told you that big around. Well, truthfully, you may not find that. And if you find that, that needs to be at the bottom, not up at the top. The top needs to be skinnier than the bottom, right? The next thing that you're gonna see is, is that they're different lengths. Now you can spend the time over there breaking them and getting them to where they are the same length, but you don't have to. I'm going to show you what you do, okay? So come in over here closer. Ah, what I did was, is I've got my two skinniest ones on this side, and then i got my thicker one on this side. We're going to put the thicker one in the middle. I wanted to take my shortest one that way and lay it to where it would overlap my thick stick by about a foot or so. That's enough. And then what I did with my other stick, it's pretty long. All I did was I matched the feet up on it as much as I could and I pushed it forward that way. Once again, if you wanted to, you could break it off about right here and make it equal, but you don't have to, okay? So, we're about to do something called a lash. As a matter of fact, this one has a specific name. It's called a three-bar shear lash. I'm not that good. I googled it right before we turned the camera on because I couldn't remember what it was from Boy Scouts, but that's what this is called. All right, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna lay these three sticks out just like this, and we're gonna start on one side. Now, I'm gonna use a knot called a clove hitch. If you don't know what a clove hitch is, it doesn't matter. Just make a little knot on one side. So the way you do a clove hitch is you make an X, and then you put your string through the middle of the X, like that. Okay, and what that is, is that's a cinch knot. Now I'm gonna go ahead and put a half hitch, half hitch on it there too, just so it doesn't go away. But do you see how I came back about six or eight inches or so and got it right there? All right, the next thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna wait for this plane to go by. This could happen in the outdoors. You know what? We'll do it with the plane in the background because I live close to an airport and there's this little plane that keeps making circles around has been driving me bonkers. So we'll keep going. All right, a lash has a couple of parts. The first part is the start knot, which we just did. Then we've got something called wraps. And I'm not kidding, the next name is called fraps. And then we got the end knot, all right? So the wraps are what wrap around all of the sticks. Now, what you wanna do is you wanna go all around all three sticks, but you don't wanna make it too tight. I'll show you here in just a minute how tight you should be, but you just wanna kinda loosely go around them. The next thing is, is that you don't wanna go too loose around them. Oh, I gotta show you this too. I made a little hack right here. So if you're doing this by yourself, if you got buddies, buddies can sit here and hold this up off the ground. But if you're doing it by yourself, as you'll see, I put these rocks underneath it to keep my sticks up in the air so that I could uh, get my string up underneath the bottom of it without it going all over the place. Didn't get it quite high enough. All right, so when you do your wraps, you see how I'm making them like that? You're gonna do about four or five. I don't remember how many they told us in Boy Scouts, but I'd say four or five is probably best. All right, here are my wraps, all right? Do you see how they're all sitting right there? Now, the next part is the important part. We're gonna do the fraps. And what fraps do is, is fraps cinch down your wraps. Look what my fingers are doing. You see how I'm tightening it up like that? 
and tighten it up like that that's what makes our tripod work so I'm actually gonna go ahead and get me some string out and I'm going to cut it so I'm not fighting this thing the whole time hope I got enough and always when you cut your string put a knot in the end of it that way it don't unravel all right so we got our fraps I'm gonna go under and around. Now your fraps need to be pretty tight. But you don't want to be so tight on either middle or outside stick that the uh, tripod can't stand up. If you get it too tight, the tripod won't stand up. If you get it too loose, the tripod will stand up and then it'll fall over. So got to be careful with that. All right. Now what I do, I put about four fraps in there. I'm going to go back under that middle stick like that. And I'm going to put fraps on this side. We're going to do one, two, three, four, five. And then we're going to finish up with a half hit or a clove hitch over here on this side. See, I've got my X. i got to loosen it up just a little bit oh, so I can get my string through. boom like that and if you want to you can do like I told you and put another half inch in the bottom of it all right that's the end of that we're gonna go into our next segment because this one got a little bit long in the next segment we'll stand this tripod up and I'll show you how to turn it into three different tents so let's get into the next segment I'll see you here in just a minute Shalom. Hello, boys and girls. Today we have five Hebrew words for you to learn. They can be found in chapter 26 in the book of Exodus. That's Shemot in Hebrew. If you're ready to see what they are, then come on and let's go. The first word you see is Shani. It's the word for scarlet, as in the scarlet thread. It is spelled with the following letters of Sheen Nun and Yud Shani The second word on the screen is Yeria It means curtain in Hebrew Can you say Yeria? Good It is spelled with the following letters of Yud, Resh, Yud, and He. Yeria. The third word for today is Chamesh. It's the word for five in Hebrew. Chamesh is spelled with the following Hebrew letters of Chet. Mem and Sheen. Together they spell Chamesh. The fourth word that you see on the screen is Kesef. It means silver. Now you say it. Kesef. The letters of Kaf, 
Samech, and final pay together spell Kesef. The fifth and final word for today is Zaha. It is the Hebrew word for gold. Zahav is spelled using the letters of Zayn, He, and Bet. Zahav. Okay, kids, it's time to review the words that we just learned. When you see the words pop up on the screen, then shout it out loud. Let's go! Good job, boys and girls. Avodah Tovah. You just learned five Hebrew words. Practice makes perfect, so keep practicing. And until next time, Shabbat Shalom, Veli Triot. Shabbat Shalom, y'all. Miss Jessica here with our history lesson today, and I hope you all have been having a wonderful Shabbat so far. In today's scripture, we see lots of explanations on how things were supposed to look and be made for the tabernacle. Some of those things included metalworks, making hooks, overlaying things with gold. Want to take a guess at who would have done those things? Good guess, a blacksmith. Well, blacksmithing is still done today, and it's still done pretty close in some ways to what it used to be done long ago. While some aspects have gotten easier, like the fire used for heating because some folks use propane, while most folks still use coal or charcoal, it's still a very physically demanding job. Metal is heated in a forge to a very high temperature, removed from the heat, and hammered into the desired shape. Blacksmiths rely on their tools to help them be able to safely create their works of art. Tongs are a very important tool of a blacksmith. They allow the blacksmith to safely hold the metal in place as they're hammering it into shape. And the hammer is also obviously a very important tool as well. It's used to slowly shape the metal into whatever shape is desired. It can take multiple times heating the same piece of metal, meaning it would have to be reheated in the forge over and over so that it can be kept shaping into what it will be. They don't hit the work when the metal is cold. Doing this can create a cold shunt that weakens the work. A cold shunt is where the hot and cold parts create a weak spot. When a blacksmith needs to stretch the metal out, imagine kind of stretching and rolling out Play-Doh. Something similar to that, obviously, though not rolling it out by hand. This is called drawing out. The metal is hit on all four sides over and over as it is rotated, causing it to elongate. This method is also used to create nails by basically making a four-sided pyramid with a pointed end. Another term used in blacksmithing is upsetting. This is when you apply force to the end of a piece of work to make the metal mushroom out and add volume to it. It's upsetting it. Peening is another important term used in blacksmithing. This is when you apply force to move the metal in a certain direction. You can move the metal in one direction or you can spread it out in all directions depending upon how you're hitting it. Quenching is placing the heated metal into an ice water or cold bath water to cool the piece of metal that the blacksmith has been working on. This technique is often used to cool the end of the work once it's been shaped, either in order to work on the other end of the piece or as a way of making the metal harder for tempering. Blacksmithing is a very precise job. It takes more than muscle alone to pound the metal out into something beautiful. It takes patience and hard work to create these magnificent pieces. There are loads of blacksmithing videos that you can find on YouTube, and maybe later today you and your family can find a neat video of a blacksmith creating something amazing. And before we go, here's a fun little fact for you. Tupel Cain is known for being the first blacksmith in scripture from Genesis or Bereshith chapter 4, 22. Well, I hope you all have a blessed Shabbat, and I hope that we see you back here next week. Shabbat Shalom.
Hi, Torah friends. I'm contractor Je Mr. Jeremiah. And I'm Solomon Alvarado. Nice Hi. to meet you. Hi, guys. We're, um, we're actually helping to work on the curtains for the temple. As, we, as you were reading in Exodus chapter 26, Moshe got the instructions on how to build the, the tabernacle, right? The tabernacle, yeah. not the temple. Yeah, it looks like you kind of read the blueprint wrong. Oh, you're right. Sorry about that, buddy. Uh, mm -hmm. Sorry about that, uh, partner. Um, so uh, right now we're kind of stuck in a little bit of uh, cement here. Uh, you guys can see we kind of our feet are stuck. So we're going to have to get back to you guys in a little bit here once we figure out how to get out of there. But we're going to have a really cool moral story coming up on following directions. See you in a bit. That's home. Hey there, Torah friends. This is contractor Jeremiah here. And I wanted to talk to you a little bit about um, blueprints. So if you look at this card, you notice that there's lines that go back and forth here. That is graph paper that they use to make a blueprint for like a, a building, or uh, it could be like a school, it could be a, a government building or a restaurant. And so uh, Moshe is the one who received the blueprints from Yahweh. And, but unfortunately, he didn't get it in graphic form. He got it, or in a picture form, he got it through words. So today we're going to do a, a little exercise that's going to challenge our builders today um, on how well they can follow instructions. And I'm going to do my best to make sure the instructions are clear. So hang in there and we'll be right with you. Hey there, Torah friends. We have our two builders today that are helping to build the tabernacle. Over on the left-hand side, we have Solly, the builder. Hey, Solly. Hey. And then on the right side, we have Vundi the Builder. Hey, Vundi. All right, so we're going to listen really well to my instructions today, okay? So first thing we have to do is to get our materials for building. So what we're going to do is we're going to grab one orange cone. So go ahead and get that. Awesome. Now we're going to get uh, an I-beam. An I-beam. Um, can you guys show us what it looks like uh, that way? So it looks like an eye. Thank you, Bundy. Okay. All right. Now we got, uh, we need one barrel, and those are yellow. Okay, we got color, and we got a description. Good. Now we have, uh, we need, let's see, one board. So that's going to be like a wooden board. Perfect. And... I think the last thing we need is an actual builder. So it's kind of funny, but for this case, our builder is actually part of the building, which actually reminds me of a scripture that says that we are a part of, uh, we're, we are stones, living stones as part of Yahweh's, um, Yahweh's building. All right, so now guys, I'm going to instruct you guys on how to build this structure, okay? okay. So listen very carefully. Step one goes your builder. So that's the first thing you're going to put on your platform. All right. Then right above that goes your I-beam. Okay. On top of that is your barrel. Okay. And then on top of that is your, your board. And on the very top is your cone. All right. Now let's see if they got it right. What do you guys think? Hey. Yeah. It looks like you did. Awesome. You guys followed instructions great. Awesome. All right, friends. So you saw how we demonstrated following directions using our game. Now, if you'd like to try this game out at home, you don't have to go and buy this. All you have to do is gather up some common household items, anything you have. Today, we have a cup, 
we have a water bottle and we have a book. And so um, Bunny's going to demonstrate some different formations that you can use to give your friend or, or relative instructions. Okay, there's one. Oh wow, balancing act. All right, there's two. And then one more. You wanna do the one with the opening the book, like the tabernacle? <laughs> there you go. Okay, and there's three. So you can use your imagination. Now you can play with these items and draw a picture of the different formations, making your own blueprints. And then you can read those blueprints off to your partner and see if they make them correctly. So that is how you can replicate this at home. Have fun guys. Shabbat shalom. shalom. Hey Sally, how are we gonna get out of this mess already? I don't know, like, nobody's here right now. Oh, man. Hey, there's Contractor Vuddy! Contractor Vuddy, come on! Come Contractor Vuddy! Hey, uh, can you help us out? Sure. We're literally stuck. Okay. All right, here we go. Whoa! Yeah, Whoa. Hold on to your hat, I got my other one free. Yeah, how about you, bud? Yeah. Which one? Yeah. Ah. Yeah. Ah. Yay, we got out. That's teamwork. So thank you guys for joining us today for uh, the moral story and the Bible reading. And we hope you have a blessed Shabbat. And this has been a great episode. I'm really loving it. All right, so far in this episode, we've learned about how Yahweh made his tent. We learned how to lash a tripod. Now we got to figure out how to turn a tripod into a tent for ourselves. So what you're going to do is, is after you've done everything we talked about, you're going to stand right here in the middle. And it's great if you have friends to do this with. If you don't, that's okay. So you're going to stand it up like this. All right. So be careful. You see how that's weeble wobbly? What you do next is, is you take this stick and you stick it over here and you take this stick and you stick it over there. And now, you see how I'm in a tent, right? So this is a tripod, it's really cool. So what you can do next is, this kind of looks like a teepee, right? Well, if you wanted to make it into a teepee, all you do is you take a couple more sticks and you stick it on the insides and you take a tarp and you wrap it around the outside. At home, you can use a sheet. In the wilderness, they probably use skin. I know they use skin, but you'd stretch it out and make the skin on top of it. Seems like y'all would use skin to go around his tent, didn't he? Pretty cool, right? All right, so this will make a teepee. Now notice this too. You see how I got the string sitting here? This was accidental, but if you're using this for not making a tent, you can also use it, or even as a tent, if you had a fire in the middle of here, you could use this over to hang stuff with and all kinds of things, so pretty cool. All right, so we got a teepee type build right here. That's cool. The next type of tent you can make, and I can't remember what this is called, but it's still a cool tent. You get a cross piece and you stick it right here and you see how that comes all the way down like this then what you do is you take and you drape your tarp on top of it like this so it goes all the way down through here on both sides this is your entrance so you come walking into your tent and you're sitting right here and you have all this extra space all right so that's tent number two Tent number three would be like an A-frame type tent. In order to do that, you're gonna to have to make yourself another tripod. So you make another tripod for this side, which would raise this up like this, and then you take your tarp and put half of it on this side and half of it on that side, and then you have a sure enough, you bet you A-frame tent. So there are three different types of tents that you can make in your backyard and have a lot of fun with it. Is that cool? Awesome. All right, let's finish up this Sabbath school. We got another song, we've got craft, we got snack, which everybody loves, and then we'll get prayed out. I hope y'all have a fantastic Sabbath. I'll see you next time.
Shabbat Shalom everyone! This is Miss Shannon with a new memory verse for you. This week we have 2 Corinthians 5.1 in the KJV. Let's start by reading our verse. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of Elohim, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. 2 Corinthians 5.1 Now that we have an overview of our verse, Let's work on memorizing it. Fill in the blanks and pause the video if you need more time. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of Elohim, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. 2 Corinthians 5.1 Great! Now let's try it one more time. Pause the video if you need another minute to figure it out. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of Elohim, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. 2 Corinthians 5.1 Alright, now it's time to try reciting your memory verse. Pause the video if you need more time. And don't worry if you don't get it all right. Just give it a shot. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of Elohim, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. 2 Corinthians 5.1 Give yourselves a pat on the back. You did it! Now let's have a brief discussion about this verse. So here's the weekly question. What is our verse about and how does it relate to our chapter? Well, there are a lot of really neat things about the tabernacle, which we probably learned about today already. One of those things is that our bodies are kind of likened into the tabernacle, like in this verse. We move around just like the tabernacle gets moved around, and we are supposed to have the presence of Yah abiding in us. What this verse is basically saying is that when our bodies die, we'll be giving new bodies a new home with Elohim. What a truly wonderful promise. So once again, here's our memory verse for this week. Remember to keep practicing it as much as you need. As always, I pray you have a blessed week ahead, and Shabbat Shalom! Hi kids, it's craft time with Miss Sarah and my daughter Eden. This week's inspiration for our craft was Exodus 26.1. You are to make the tent with ten curtains of fine woven linen and with blue, purple, and scarlet material. You are to make them with cherubim skillfully worked into them. So this week we will be making woven friendship bracelets. And Eden will be showing you how to do it. Your end product is going to look something like this here. You will need at least three strands of colored embroidery thread, a clipboard or a safety pin and pillow to keep your um, strings stable, and a pair of scissors. So here I am just making a simple granny knot and you need to make sure that your colors are in the order which, in which you want them to appear in the final bracelet. Now I am clipping it to my clipboard, and you can also pin it to a pillow if you wish. So you need to take your first string, the leftmost string, and put it over and under the string to the right. And this knot should be tied twice every time. Repeat until your first string 
on my example it's the pink string, is all the way to the right. So this is how my first row turned out, and when you begin your second row, you will again begin with the leftmost string, and repeat the same with the same steps that you did with your first string. In my example, this is the pink one. Continue until you reach the desired length. If you'd like your bracelet to be wider, start with more strands. Our end product has 8 strands. Now as you finish your last row, go ahead and tie a knot similar to the one that you tied in the beginning. and trim off the excess. And here's what your finished product should look like. Enjoy making your bracelets! Shabbat Shalom! Hi kids, it's Miss Sarah again and we've got a great snack for you this week. A lot of us have been celebrating Passover this last week and so we wanted to share one of our favorites. We'll be making matzah bark or toffee chocolate matzah. Your ingredients for this is going to be enough matzah to cover your cookie sheet, one cup of butter, which is two sticks, one cup firmly packed brown sugar, one 12 ounce bag of chocolate chips, and one cup of sliced or crushed nuts, which is optional. I used almonds on mine. So we're gonna start with your matzah. Of course, store-bought is fine as well. Arrange it on your cookie sheet. I've got about 11 pieces here, I think. I had to cut some of them in half to make them fit. Okay, you're gonna start with your two sticks of butter. Go ahead and put them in your pot and begin melting them down all the way. And next you're gonna take your brown sugar. You want one cup of firmly packed brown sugar. And you're gonna go ahead and take that and add it to the pot with your butter and begin stirring. You're, after you've stirred it together and it's kind of begin to dissolve, you wanna turn your heat up to about medium high. And after that, um, your mixture should begin boiling. And after about three minutes of bubbling and boiling, it should begin to get kind of foamy. Continue to stir it, and after it's gotten foamy, you can go ahead and take it off of the heat. And at that point, you can begin to pour it over your pieces of matzah. Try to spread it evenly. You can use a spatula. Next, you're gonna get your chocolate chips. You want to pour those and spread them out evenly over your matzah pieces. And then at that point, you wanna place the cookie sheet of your matzah in the oven for about two or three minutes in a warm oven and allow the chocolate chips to soften. And then take it out and use your spatula to spread the chocolate evenly over all of your pieces of matzah. Finally, you wanna take, uh, if you're using nuts, go ahead and crush them up if you need to and spread them evenly over the whole pan of matzah. 
and this is what it should look like in the end. Um, this recipe can be easily doubled or tripled. Uh, let your matzah cool and harden up for a couple of hours or overnight. Of course, you can speed that process up by putting it in the refrigerator. When you're finished, you can cut it into squares like this. Your matzah will store in a covered container for several days, but it probably won't last that long. I know it doesn't at my house. Enjoy your treat and Shabbat Shalom, kids! Well, Shabbat Shalom, my little Torah friends, and my big Torah friends. It's good to have you visiting with us today. I was just finishing up reading uh, today's lesson and the scriptures, and I uh, was really thinking a lot about just how much detail that Yahweh put into having his tent built that he was going to have set up within the children of Israel so that they could worship him. And, you know, he really, really gave Moshe a lot of details on how to build that tent. Have, have you ever played with Legos? I'm sure you have, or blocks. And, and you saw a picture on the front of the box, and you said, I want to I wanna build that. And you started to figure out that it's pretty important that you have the, um, the, the instructions there to show you which parts go together to make that that thing whether it's a truck or a house or whatever you're building or or let's say let's say that you like to cook and and you start to understand that that recipes can be very important because it gives us all the ingredients that we need to put put it together to make that delicious dish well that's kind of the way that Yahweh was doing with Moshe here he was giving him a plan a design exactly the way that he wanted it so that it could be uh, made in a way that the children of Israel could take their house to worship Yahweh with them everywhere they went. And you know, that's why, that's why he gave Moshe such thorough instructions, because that way it was made exactly the way that Yahweh wanted it built. And he gave Moshe a plan that was like the one that's in the heavens. And that's really, really cool. Now, when we're reading this, we see that it's pretty complex. You know what complex means? It means that there are lots of parts that have to go together to make something work. And you know what? Yahweh designs things like that a lot of times. Matter of fact, there's usually a lot of complexity. That means it's complex. A lot of complexity in, in his designs. Maybe you can get mom or dad to uh, look up on the internet show you a picture of, of what an eyeball looks like on the inside just to see how many things Yahweh has to put together just to make it where we can see. And that's just one little thing. And Yahweh made the tabernacle, his dwelling place, this way so that he could be worshipped everywhere the children of Israel went in the way that he wanted to be worshipped in the place where he wanted to be worshipped. And you know, when we talk about Yahweh's design, you're, you're part of his design too. You're part of it, and I'm part of it, and he has a special place for you and for me in his plan. And you know what? He wants to be with us everywhere we go, just like he did with the children of Israel when he made the tabernacle. And he wants to be having our heart a dwelling place for him so that so that we know that he is near and so as we as we go through this next week let's let's um think about just how important we really are to yahweh that that he would put us together in such a unique and wonderful way and have a special plan for us just like he does for everyone else so let's go and uh, talk to the Father for just a moment before we finish this episode this week. Almighty Yahweh, our Father in heaven, praise be to your name. It is most set apart. We love you, Yahweh, so very much. We thank you so very much that you care about us the way that you do. Father, that you have uh, put us together in a way that, that is perfect the way that you want us put together. And you have a plan for us. 
And we pray, Father, that that yes, we we can we can look into your word and see that your word tells us that that that, that plan includes uh, obeying you and being in your covenant, and that you will be our Elohim. But also, Father, we know that you have other plans for us as well, like like. Um, getting married and having children or or even uh, making things uh, for uh, our our worship services for uh, special things to take care of people around our homes taking care of our pets um, there's just there's just so many many things that that go into making our lives special and we thank you that you put your hand on us and that you have your eye on us and that you uh, that you care about us and that you you uh, want us to do well so we pray father as we go through this next week to help us to to look around the world at the the amount of wonderful detail that you put into it the way that you put it into the the trees and the and the birds and the air and the our, our brothers and sisters our moms and dads just everything that's in this world around us, Father, that you have touched to make it a wonderful place for us to live. And we really do look forward, Father, to when your new kingdom comes. Because as beautiful as this world is, it's just hard to imagine what the new one will be like. So, Father, we just want to say thank you again for taking care of us, watching over us, loving us, and being there for us. And we thank you, Father, that you hear our prayers. And we pray all these things in the name of Yahshua Hamasiach, and for your great name's sake, hallelujah. Well, my little Torah friends, that's it for this week. And uh, really glad that you were able to stop by and visit with us. And we look forward to getting together on our next regular Shabbat meetings. So, until then, have a great week, and Shabbat Shalom. Lots of room in there. What is it? It's a teepee. Get in it. Can you sit down? Yeah. Do I have to sit down? Sit down. It's amazing sauce. I, I, I think it's a frog ribbit. <laughs> Would that be fun to play in? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. yeah. Cool.